The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today, we are going to do something a little different. We are still going to be in our series on end time prophecy today and tomorrow. But if you notice, we are in part 200 of our daily teachings. So I want our 200 for our series on end time prophecy. So what I wanted to do is take today and tomorrow and recap two main subjects on end time prophecy. Just a quick review to make sure we're all on the same page and then we'll jump back into the book of Isaiah next week. But as I was praying last night and as the Lord was speaking to me, these two main issues um, really came alive on the inside of my heart. And so what I want to do is I want to go and just review them one more time. Obviously, we've talked about these in the beginning, but it's been a little while since we talked about these. So I want to take some time today and then tomorrow to talk about these two subjects. Today, we are speaking of Israel. We're going to be talking about Israel and tomorrow we're going to be dealing with time. So two really foundational and fundamental truths dealing with end time prophecy. One is Israel, the nation of Israel, and the other one is the understanding of time. What is time? So we're going to talk about both of those understandings over the next two days, and then we'll go right back into the book of Isaiah and go to chapter 13. So today we're going to Romans chapter 11, and we're going to read the first six verses and understanding God's promises and God's covenants to the nation of Israel. And then I want to say a couple public declarations in reference to the nation of Israel. So Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory. Father, let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll go with me to Romans chapter 11. Let's, let's read the first six verses. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself thousand, seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at the present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Now that's a powerful declaration that Paul gives in Romans chapter 11, and I just want to say, if you read Romans chapter 10 and Romans chapter 11, you could also read Romans chapter 9, but 10 and 11 specifically, Paul gives God's heart in reference to the nation of Israel. And these are these are really specific things, and I, I, I need to say this very directly today. One, it's on my heart, and two, it just needs to be pointed out because we are seeing a very big and bad problem in America right now. Now, of course, if you know, we are in Brazil doing missions, and I, I haven't seen it really here in Brazil yet, and I pray to God that it doesn't come here. 
but I do see it back in America. So I want to address this publicly and I want to take our stance on this. And I just want to, I want to make sure it's very clear. I stand against all anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic rhetoric, language, the hatred of the Jewish people. We stand against that. We stand for Israel and we stand for God's purposes for Israel. Now I want to say something. Israel does not do everything right. Just like America doesn't do everything right. There is no person alive that is perfect other than the man that walked on the earth whose name was Jesus. So I'm not saying Israel's perfect. I'm not saying they do everything right. I'm not saying there cannot be any type of criticism against Israel because if you do something wrong, you know, it's wrong. But I do want to say, as Paul said, did God cast away Israel? God forbid. Listen, there is covenant promises made to the nation of Israel. And if we're going to study end time prophecy, and if we're going to truly understand God's purposes for all mankind, not just Israel, but all mankind, we need to understand that it is Jerusalem centric. Jesus is coming back to rule and reign in Jerusalem. It is the city of the great king. And the narrative is centered around Jerusalem. That's it's very simple. If you've never studied end time prophecy, obviously we're 200 parts. There's a hundred hours of teaching on this, but I encourage you to go into that and just, you'll see it over and over. Jesus marches into Jerusalem. The antichrist surrounds Jerusalem, abomination of desolation in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the central focus of the story. That's very easy to see, but it is Israel focused. The time of the Gentiles, Israel comes into salvation. Israel is the first fruits of God. Israel has a dynamic role to play because they have an election according to Abraham by God. It's, it's very clear. Now, I want to say some things about this. This election, which if you read the rest of 11, it'll, it'll talk more about this election. But there are two groups of people on the earth that do not agree or do not like Israel's election. One is the Gentiles. They hate the fact that Israel has an election. They were chosen up by God. When you say, well, I, I don't like that. Well, you don't have to like it. It is true though. And the reason why is there are covenant promises made by God thousands of years ago. See, it's not just that Abraham had a promise because Abraham did. But Isaac then had a promise. Then Jacob, who became Israel, had a promise. You know, he is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became Israel. There is covenant promises made down the lineage to the nation of Israel. Now, you may say, why is there such conflict in the Middle East? Well, the conflict stems because Abraham had Isaac, but he also had Ishmael. Now, there are uh, Muslims and Islamic people in the Middle East that claim heritage. Our father is Abraham, but they don't go down the same lineage of Isaac. They go down the lineage of Ishmael. And that's where you have those other nations and other tribes and other people in the Middle East. And of course, Abraham had uh, seven or eight more children after Sarah died. So you have two big differences right there. You have God's election that goes down through Isaac, the promised child given unto Abraham and Sarah. And then you have the other child, which was Ishmael and those kids. Now, God gave promise covenant rights and, and he gave promise to Hagar and to Ishmael. He did that at the tree. You know, you go back and read in the book of Genesis. They have specific covenants with God, but it's not the same as Israel's covenant that came from Abraham to Isaac. Now, Isaac had two children. You had Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob is the one that received the promise. It went right down the line, but that's because Esau sold his birthright. He sold it away. He did not regard the birthright and the promises of God. He gave it away. And if you remember Esau, in his anger and out of rebellion against God, he made a volitional choice, went and married in the strange lands. So you have to remember, there were choices that were made thousands of years ago that have consequences, 
not even just to now, but for all of eternity. The election took place way back then. But here's something I want to say about this. Not only was the election thousands of years ago when it comes to the nation of Israel, but you need to understand there are people that believe, oh, that was God's election. Israel doesn't do everything right. They don't deserve it. Well, the truth is nobody deserves what God does in their life. And something I really want to just set straight on this specific issue is just because you are not a born Jew, you're not born in the nation of Israel, you're not a part of the 12 tribes, does not mean that you cannot serve the Lord and enter into their promise. See, as Gentile believers, the Bible says we are grafted into the vine. We participate in what God promised Israel. So the only way us as Gentile believers even receive promise is we receive promise by being grafted into their promise. You say, well, why is that important? Well, if you remember when Joshua came over the River Jordan, and taking the nation of Israel into the promised land, and they get to the walls of Jericho. When they start, you know, they walk around the wall seven times, the walls of Jericho fall. Not exactly. All of the wall, except for one sliver of the wall, stayed standing. You say, what do you mean one part of the wall? Well, if you remember, Rahab the harlot, her house was on the wall. That's what it says. Her house was on the wall. So, that little sliver of wall where her house was and her family was, that was left standing because she made a covenant with those two spies that she protected and let down another way to make sure they didn't get killed inside of Jericho to send them back to the land. Rahab was spared. Well, another place you can go back and look at this is with Boaz and Ruth. See, Ruth was with her mother-in-law when her husband her brother-in-law and her father-in-law all were killed. They died. But she said, instead of going back to my people, I will serve your God. And she went back with her mother-in-law to her heritage, which is Israel, that nation. And that's where she married Boaz. And it's through that lineage that you get all the way to David, all the way to Jesus. So just because you were not born a Jew does not mean you cannot participate in the covenants of God. You can't participate in the promise. You can, but it's by choice. I want you to understand that when God judges, God judges righteously because man makes choices. So here's the two reasons why we say this. There is anti-Semitic and anti-Semitism right now brewing in the United States on college campuses in schools, even in churches, in which people have this hatred of the Jewish people, and they're calling for the death to Jews and all kinds of things. And it is absolutely 100% of hell, and it is ungodly. It's ungodly. It truly is. You need to understand what I'm saying right now. I'm taking a firm stance against this. You know, you need to love people. Hatred of people in general is wrong, but specifically, there is an outright hatred of the Jewish people. Now, this is not something new. I mean, this has been happening for over 4,000 years. People have had this outright hatred of the Jewish people, and it's because God made covenants with Abraham. And that covenant went down to Isaac, and it went down to Jacob, who became Israel, and it came down to those people. You may say, I don't like it. You can participate, yet there are people in the earth that instead of coming alongside Israel, standing with God's purposes for Israel, decide to take the alternative route and hate Israel instead. And that's right there, 100% fully ungodly. It is ungodly. And so I just want to, take today to take this stance against anti-Semitism. You know, Adolf Hitler had so much hatred. He had hatred for lots of groups of people, but there was a specific focus in the life of Adolf Hitler against Jewish 
people, against people from the nation of Israel. He had a specific hatred of Jews. You say, well, why was it so specific against Jews? It's very simple. It's from hell. Because it was the seed of the woman that would birth the Messiah. It came through the lineage of Israel. Jesus is a Jew. And if you want to know real specifically when we talk about end time prophecy, I said I'm referencing a lot of these things. I'm not really, I don't have time to ref, go to all of them. We've studied a lot of this. But for Jesus to return and to go in to the city of Jerusalem and to go into the temple and throw the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire, to bind the devil in prison and to rule for a thousand years, God cannot break covenant. God cannot break his word. And one of the things Jesus said while he was on the earth is, I'm not coming back. You won't see me again until you say, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's a prophetic word going back into the Old Testament. He who comes in the name of the Lord is the Messiah. So until the leadership, political and religious leaders in the nation of Israel say, you are the Messiah, he won't come back into the land. That's a very specific detail because in the book of the Revelation in chapter 7, before you see judgment from God against the earth, you've seen the seals, you've seen warnings, you've seen things happen, but the actual judgment of God against the earth does not take place until the 144,000 are sealed in Jerusalem, in this nation of Israel, because they have to be there for Jesus to be called the Messiah by Israel to actually enter back in. He can't enter in without it because he'd break his word. I'm not going to do it until that. So God's people have to be there. So there is an outright hatred from the pit of hell against Israel, against the Jewish people that wants to kill the Jewish people so that that prophecy of Jesus cannot come to pass and hell would win. That's the whole basis of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism and the hatred of the Jewish people is not some new thing. It's a, besides the fact it's not new, it's not created by man. That's what we really need to understand. Anti-Semitism and the hatred of the Jewish people is not a man-made idea. It's an idea from the pit of hell. It's from the devil himself that has placed this hatred of Jewish people in the heart of man and believers even, which is terrible to say, but it's true. We're even seeing it in the church. And this, I want to say right now, if you are in the church, you are a born again believer and you hate Jewish people, you need to go ahead and really sit down and pray and talk to the Lord. Because if you love God and hate the Jewish people, you're not standing with God. You might not be born again. You might be on the road to hell and you don't even know it. So I just, I know that's a pretty bold statement, but you, I'm going to be very bold today. This is, I watched a Senate hearing in the United States. I watched it online. This is only from just a little while ago. This, this hearing happened yesterday about public schools and the anti-Semitism that is taking place in America, in America, the hatred of the Jewish people. And a lot of this comes from just pure ignorance and the regurgitation of what other people say by our young people because they don't know any better. But the fact that young people are saying it stems from adults, us, who are taking a wrong stance against Israel. Now, I'm not saying Israel does everything right. Yes, they make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. That's why it says if it's grace, it's by grace and not by work. They, they're, they're not receiving because they do everything right. It's by grace. But you should remember, Ephesians is very clear. Chapter 2, verse 8, grace by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is speaking of your salvation. So the fact that you are born again is not by works. The fact that Israel is under covenant is not by works either. The fact that they have these promises is by grace and grace alone. The same way you are born again by grace and grace alone, not of works. So just because we receive does not mean God's not going to do what he said to them. 
This is a very big point, but it needs to be understood. So I just want to say this because this is starting to arise more and more, especially with the war that is taking place in Gaza and inside of Israel right now. And there is an outright fight against uh, oppression. You know, last year in October, there was the rape and murder of the Jewish people. It was a terrible atrocity. And the nation of Israel has taken swift, violent action against that in defense of its people, in defense of its right to exist as a sovereign nation. And I stand with Israel for that. This church stands with that. And we do believe that God stands with that. It is very extreme right now. It is very violent, the conflict that is happening in the nation of Israel. But we stand with Israel's right to defend itself. And we stand against all Semitic language, all anti-Semitism or hatred of the Jewish people. And I just want to address where this comes from. Because inside of the church, we have these wrong ideas. Oh, they hate each other because of this and that and this. No, it's very clear. People hate Israel because of Israel's election. That's one. I didn't say the other one. That's Israel's not always happy with the election either. Because they have an election. They have it. Whether they like it or not, they are chosen of God. And they have this covenant. And not all people of Israel like that because it causes the conflict. So both Jews and Gentiles are not always on board with the fact that God has this covenant. But God won't break the covenant. And the nation of Israel won't either. The covenant of circumcision stands in the nation of Israel. They, they won't break it because it's God's divine protection for them. But you need to understand where this all stems from. And in the context of end time prophecy, it is no more fitting than today to be able to have this conversation and for you to understand why these things are happening. There is prophetic scripture in the word of God dealing with the Lord Jesus's return. Your Messiah as a born again believer, but also the Messiah for the nation of Israel, because Jesus is a Jew of the tribe of Judah. He is a Jewish man and he is coming back. And it is a Jewish man that will rule and reign for a thousand years on the earth. He's a Jew. He's not an American. He's not a Brazilian. He's a Jew. He's a Jewish man of the tribe of Judah. So you need to understand that. And you need to understand why this has happened. The devil hates Israel because there are promises and there are prophetic words from the lips of Jesus himself about his return and about his open rule and reign on the earth and the destruction of the Antichrist based on Israel's existence as a nation. For Israel to be a nation and for Israel to call him Messiah, those types of prophetic words are what the devil uses to incite such violence against Israel because the devil wants to stop those things from coming to pass. So if we understand why this is happening, we can understand why we not only stand with Israel, but we stand for God's purposes for Israel to understand why we stand with them. A lot of the church says we stand for Israel, but they don't know why. Well, Israel's in the Bible. Well, why are you standing with him? Uh, I don't know. This is why. Because it's our Messiah. So he's also Jewish. He's their Messiah. But he's also our Messiah. He's our beloved. And he's coming back to the earth for us. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. But to do that, Israel must be a nation. And we stand for God's sovereign plan for the nation of Israel, and we stand for God's purposes for Israel, and we stand 1,000% against all Semitic, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jewish people. We downright condemn it, and we call it from the pit of hell. It is an attack of Satan, and if you stand with those things and you do those things, you can take your place in hell, and you can burn in the lake of fire with Adolf Hitler if you like. I don't know how to say it more bluntly than that, but that's where we stand. And that's the position we take. And I want you to be born again. And I'm telling you right now, repent, change your thinking and change your heart and stand with God and God's purposes. But you don't have to be born again. You can go to hell if you want to, but you're going by yourself because I will not join you in this subject. 
We stand with God. We stand with Israel and we stand for God's purposes for Israel. God bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. And you know what I need before I even ask the thing. And you hold me in your hands with the kindness. The sun's not worried about the wind.